Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're diving into another distressing case, focusing on the tragic story of Sabrina Quider, a chilling incident that unfolded in an upscale London neighborhood. Compulsive thoughts, a mental affliction characterized by intrusive ideas and actions beyond an individual's control, lie at the heart of this narrative. When coupled with traits of manipulation, inherent cruelty, and an insatiable thirst for dominance, it creates a volatile mix. Despite being poised for a life of opulence and freedom, Sabrina Quater's relentless pursuit of perfection led her down a dark path. From a young age, Sabrina harbored grandiose dreams of fame, attention, and luxury. Yet, despite her every opportunity, satisfaction remained elusive. No partner met her standards, and she perpetually yearned for more. Her unfulfilled ambitions and obsessive fantasies eventually spiraled into delusions, punctuated by bouts of violence, a tragic descent into the depths of the human psyche. Sabrina directed her pent-up anger towards a vulnerable individual, escalating this case to one of the most egregious and widely publicized in British history. A once innocent woman, devoted to caring for her children, tragically fell victim to the cruelty of a disturbed perpetrator. Sabrina Quider's formative years paint a picture of a complex individual born on December 5, 1982, in a London suburb. She bore the unique blend of French and Algerian heritage inherited from her parents. This cultural fusion likely contributed to her captivating appearance and fiery disposition. As the eldest among four siblings, Sabrina basked in the adoration of her family, often held up as an exemplary model for others. However, her early years in Paris, following her family's migration when she was two, saw the emergence of a personality marked by arrogance, dominance, and selfishness. Former classmates recall her as aloof, self-absorbed, and disdainful, leaving her with few companions amidst her school years. She regarded those around her as unworthy of her time, further isolating herself from her peers, including other outgoing girls in her vicinity. She harbored a particularly hostile attitude towards others, viewing them as rivals and adversaries. Possessing stunning looks, a striking brunette with captivating brown eyes, and an impressive physique, Sabrina could have pursued a career in modeling had she possessed the ability to form genuine connections instead of merely seeking to manipulate others. During her childhood, Sabrina exhibited an active interest in sports and music. However, her inconsistency, impatience for immediate results, and lack of sustained effort thwarted her success in any endeavor. Years later, Sabrina claimed to have endured harsh treatment from her maternal relatives in France during her formative years. However, these assertions lacked substantiation, with her family insisting that she was indulged and always sought attention. As a teenager, Sabrina's athletic pursuits were hampered by a back injury, leading to a reliance on prescription painkillers. Her desperation for these drugs drove her to illegal means, resulting in her arrest and a police warning. Throughout her life, Sabrina remained intensely focused on herself and her appearance, craving constant attention. She harbored unwavering belief in a future of wealth, glamour, celebrity encounters, and personal stardom, often blurring the lines between her fantasies and reality. In her mind, her rightful place seemed to be among the glittering lights of Hollywood. Sabrina eventually graduated from the Sorbonne, with a degree in English and French literature, a testament to her academic pursuits amidst the tumult of her personal life. However, since 2006, she had laid claim to various roles within the fashion industry, including stylist, makeup artist, fashion designer, or simply a designer, despite lacking substantial expertise in these domains. Sabrina Quider's relationship with Wissem Maduni, characterized by its complexity, was emblematic of her tendency to captivate men and exploit their affections for her own gain. Despite her alluring looks, she never deemed any of her suitors worthy of a serious commitment, perpetually holding out for a partner who would obediently fulfill her every desire. Upon completing school, Sabrina remained uncertain about her life's direction, 
harboring a sense of entitlement to success without exerting significant effort. Nonetheless, she enrolled at the prestigious Sorbonne University while concurrently working at a confectionery shop to support herself financially. It was there, at the age of 18, that she crossed paths with Wiesam Maduni. Maduni, six years her senior, held a managerial position at a prominent French company's headquarters and pursued studies at one of Paris's esteemed universities. Despite lacking conventional attributes of handsomeness or affiliation with elite circles or celebrity spheres, he found himself deeply enamored with Sabrina. He was committed to fulfilling her every whim and fancy, driven by his profound love for her. Sabrina, in turn, perceived Maduni as an attractive prospect, viewing him as someone she could manipulate while also recognizing him as a potential gateway to a life of affluence and ambition. And capable of achieving remarkable career success, Wissom was prepared to indulge and lavish Sabrina with luxuries. The couple embarked on their relationship in 2000 and swiftly decided to cohabit. However, Sabrina's true nature soon surfaced, revealing her penchant for controlling Wissom in every aspect of their relationship. When her desires weren't met, she resorted to tantrums, manipulative tactics, and even physical violence. Moreover, she openly engaged in infidelity, showing no remorse or justification for her actions. She was willing to have flings with anyone, from casual acquaintances to Wissom's closest friends or colleagues. Despite Wissom's numerous attempts to end the relationship and depart from her, he found himself unable to break free from the depths of his love for Sabrina. In 2001, Wissom accomplished his master's degree and received a significant promotion, resulting in a substantial increase in income. He spared no expense in pampering Sabrina, lavishing her with luxurious clothing and entertainment. Wissom's family owned several properties in Paris, which he managed, diverting all rental income to Sabrina. With Franco-Algerian roots like Sabrina's, Wissom saw a kindred spirit in her. Though reports suggest the couple underwent a special Muslim ceremony in the fall of 2001, evidenced by a certificate from the Argento Mosque, this ceremony didn't render their union legally binding. Despite this, they had a son, whose paternity Wissom officially acknowledged. However, years later, a Frenchman named Anthony Francois claimed paternity of the child, describing Sabrina as volatile, unpredictable, promiscuous, and manipulative during the trial. The couple faced upheaval in 2008 with the onset of the global financial crisis, leading to the bankruptcy of Wissom's company and the loss of his lucrative job. It was during this period that Sabrina developed an obsession with relocating to London. Making the move without consulting Wissom extensively, he followed her to London, hoping for a fresh start in one of the world's premier financial centers. Once there, Wissom secured employment at a major English bank. However, Sabrina faced challenges in establishing herself within the fashion industry. Her ambitions to pursue careers as a designer, model, or makeup artist were hampered by a lack of skills, experience, and formal education in these domains. Consequently, she had to adjust her expectations over time, exploring various roles such as a nanny, call center operator, cafe worker, and even delving into network marketing. Sabrina's quest for love took an unexpected turn when she reignited her teenage passion for music, adding titles of musician and composer to her repertoire. Despite her fervor, she encountered difficulties in finding professional opportunities in the music industry. She attended numerous auditions and social gatherings in hopes of forging valuable connections. At one such event, Sabrina serendipitously crossed paths with Mark Walton, a renowned musician, songwriter, and former member of the popular Irish boy band Boyzone. Following his departure from the group, Mark ascended to success as a producer and music mogul, collaborating with esteemed artists such as Jennifer Lopez, Jessica Simpson, and Lady Gaga. By 2016, his net worth had soared to over a billion dollars. Mark embodied the embodiment of Sabrina's dreams, a gateway to a world of fame and luxury. Impressed by her beauty and charisma, Mark was instantly smitten, openly confessing his love at first sight. 
Sabrina wasted no time in pursuing a relationship with Mark, swiftly ending her ties with Wissom as she envisioned a promising future with Mark by her side. Within weeks, the couple moved in together, taking up residence in a lavish home in an upscale London neighborhood. Mark generously covered all expenses, including the rent for the opulent house hand picked by Sabrina. For several months, Sabrina reveled in the luxurious lifestyle she had long coveted, mingling with celebrities, attending elite gatherings, donning couture ensembles, and gracing the glossy pages of magazines. However, navigating her relationship with Mark proved to be a daunting task for Sabrina, fueled by her fear of losing him. Despite her efforts to suppress her controlling nature, Sabrina's insecurities soon surfaced, manifesting in bouts of jealousy towards every woman in Mark's vicinity. Over time, Sabrina's demands escalated, craving more lavish gifts and luxury experiences. Mark, eager to please Sabrina, indulged her desires with designer clothing, jewelry, and extravagant outings to elite establishments. Yet no amount of material possessions seemed to satisfy her insatiable appetite. The couple's home witnessed a revolving door of staff and nannies, as Sabrina's paranoia led her to suspect them of theft or attempting to seduce Mark. Her irrational behavior eventually pushed Mark to his breaking point. In 2011, he made the difficult decision to end their relationship, departing for California and leaving Sabrina with nothing. Losing Mark meant relinquishing the opulent lifestyle she had grown accustomed to. In her desperation, Sabrina resorted to giving interviews, accusing Mark of cruelty, violence, and substance abuse. She even went as far as pleading with him to return, threatening self-harm, but to no avail. Amidst her turmoil, Sabrina reached out to her ex-partner, Wissam Meduni, whose career had flourished as a bank executive. Despite the pain of their past, Wissam forgave Sabrina and welcomed her back into his life, still harboring feelings for her. Shortly after their reunion, Sabrina discovered she was pregnant. She promptly informed Mark, who, through his lawyers, expressed willingness to provide for the child and Sabrina, offering a monthly allowance. However, Walton insisted on a paternity test following the child's birth to confirm his fatherhood. Sabrina's refusal to undergo the test, which could have ensured substantial regular payments, hinted at her uncertainty regarding the child's paternity. Instead of agreeing to the test, she demanded Walton double the proposed allowance. Upon his refusal, she declared war on the musician. Sabrina took to social media, disseminating false allegations that Walton was obsessed with her, insanely jealous of Maduni, and physically threatening them. She accused Walton of breaking into their home, assaulting Maduni, terrifying the children, and subjecting her to sexual assault. However, she couldn't substantiate her claims, as Walton had a solid alibi, having been in the United States since their breakup. Following Walton's defamation lawsuit and police warnings, Sabrina temporarily ceased her accusations against her ex-boyfriend. She settled in Wimbledon, southwest London, with Maduni and their two children, seemingly leading a quiet life as the conflict appeared to be resolved. Unaccustomed to managing household chores and finding it challenging to handle two children, Sabrina decided to hire a nanny who could assist with housework. Posting a job advertisement online, she personally conducted interviews. However, most candidates did not meet her expectations, and those who did did not stay long in her household. A young French woman named Sophie Léon responded to the advertisement. At the time, Sophie, 19, was in her provincial hometown in France, so the interview was conducted via video call. This modest and unassuming provincial agreed to all terms, child care, household help, and cooking, for a symbolic weekly pay of 50 British pounds, including full board and lodging with the employer. Sophie was born on January 7, 1996, in the small town of Troy, nestled between Auxerre and Sens. Her parents, Catherine and Patrick Leon, led a humble life as simple workers. After completing her schooling, Sophie obtained a diploma in child care. However, she harbored aspirations beyond her provincial surroundings, longing to relocate to a bustling metropolis. Known for her shy and unassuming demeanor, coupled with a plain appearance yet a kind and open-hearted nature. 
Sophie was adored by those acquainted with her. Despite feeling somewhat self-conscious about wearing glasses due to her poor vision, Sophie exuded warmth and sincerity. During their interaction, Sabrina recognized Sophie's vulnerability and eagerness to gain experience and references, rendering her an ideal target for manipulation. In return, Sophie perceived Sabrina as a serious and reliable employer, a sentiment she shared with her parents before embarking on her journey to London. Initially, Sophie thrived in her role as the queer family's nanny, nurturing a strong bond with the children, managing household chores diligently, and seizing opportunities to enhance her English proficiency while exploring the city's attractions. However, the tranquility of this period was short-lived. Trouble brewed when Munyi lost his job, leaving the family reliant solely on monthly child support payments from Walton. Facing mounting financial strain exacerbated by escalating rent and basic living expenses, Sabrina once again pressed Walton for increased payments. In response, Walton requested a DNA test to ascertain his paternity, plunging the family into a state of financial uncertainty and distress. Unwilling to compromise on her luxuries and determined to uphold her socialite lifestyle, Sabrina grew increasingly irritable and aggressive, often venting her frustrations on the young nanny. In a bid to alleviate their financial woes, the couple ventured into a bakery business using their remaining funds only to face failure. Desperate for a lifeline, Sabrina turned to Walton, seeking a substantial sum to launch her clothing line, but her plea was met with a firm refusal, triggering tears and bitter lamentations about their financial predicament. Sabrina frequently confided in Lionette, lamenting about her former lover, while the nanny attempted to offer solace and support. The subsequent events vary depending on the source. According to one account, Sabrina concocted a scheme to exploit Sophie as a means of blackmailing Walton. She planned to depict Sophie as Walton's accomplice and lover, alleging that Sophie was strategically placed in their home to disrupt their lives and endanger the children. Sabrina claimed that the provincial nanny harbored feelings for Walton, who purportedly manipulated her for revenge. Sabrina believed that recording Sophie's fabricated confessions on tape or video would provide compelling evidence to demand compensation from Walton for his alleged transgressions. However, Sophie steadfastly refused to provide false statements on camera. Another interpretation put forth by Quare's lawyers during court proceedings posited that due to Sabrina's mental disorder, she genuinely believed in her conspiracy theory, viewing Sophie as an adversary and a threat to her family's well-being. She allegedly didn't coerce the nanny into providing false testimony, but genuinely believed Sophie was an accomplice of Walton, infiltrating their household to cause harm. Regardless of the truth, Sophie's life quickly devolved into a nightmarish ordeal, trapped within the confines of a wealthy home that transformed into a clandestine torture chamber. Initially burdened with increased workload without any corresponding increase in her meager salary, Sophie found herself ensnared in a cycle of endless chores from dawn till late at night, effectively imprisoned within the walls of the house. Her already meager pay was soon completely halted, and to prevent any chance of escape or return to France, her employers confiscated her passport, reducing her to a captive. Her communication with family was strictly monitored, and her situation deteriorated rapidly. Sophie was barely provided with adequate nourishment and constantly pressured to fabricate false statements against Walton, whom she had never even met, subjected to verbal abuse, threats, and accusations of theft. Sophie lived in constant fear of imprisonment if she didn't comply with their demands against the musician. As verbal coercion and threats failed to yield results, the Kerr family resorted to increasingly brutal and sophisticated methods of coercion. Sophie was effectively relocated to a cold, dismal basement, where she spent all her time when not toiling away at her chores. Fed scantily once or twice a day, she became emaciated and weak. Yet, the physical abuses she endured proved to be the most harrowing phasey. Beginning with slaps and hair pulling, the abusi escalated dramatically. In a violent assault, Sabrina broke Sophia's nosy, unleashing a torrent of brutality upon her. 
Each day brought new methods of cruelty designed to inflict unbearable pain and suffering. The once opulent basement of the affluent London home became a stark and sinister torture chamber for Sophie, devoid of any hope of rescue. In a strange turn of events in late summer 2017, Sabrina brought the unfortunate Sophie to a police station, claiming she was ready to testify against Mark Walton, alleging a romantic and criminal relationship. However, Sophie remained resolutely silent, refusing to comply with Sabrina's demands. Despite witnessing Sophie's malnourished and frightened state, the police's response was peculiar, and Sophie chose not to disclose the horrors transpiring at the care household, leaving her trapped in a web of fear and despair. They failed to summon a doctor or psychologist to ensure her well-being and safety. At that time, the 21-year-old nanny weighed less than 40 kilo, had partially lost her hair, was missing a front tooth, and was noticeably limping. Despite these concerning signs, the officers did not express any alarm and simply allowed everyone to depart. In mid-September, Sophie Leon made a distressing call to her mother, tearfully confessing her desire to return home, but lacking the means to do so. Catherine, without delving into details, assured her daughter that she would purchase a ticket and instructed her to pack her bags immediately. Little did she know, this would mark the final time she would hear Sophie's voice. A few days later, on September 20th, 2017, in the evening, the CARE's neighbors alerted the police after noticing a fire in the yard. While the fire itself was concerning, what troubled them more was the nauseating, sweetly greasy odor emanating from it. One neighbor immediately recognized the smell resembling burning flesh and hair, along with an unidentified substance. Upon arrival, firefighters and a police car were dispatched to the scene. The occupants of the house, seemingly calm and oblivious to the reason for the emergency services visit, greeted them after the fire was extinguished. Among the ashes, what appeared to be a charred human hand was discovered. The couple was promptly taken into custody, and severely burnt human remains were recovered from the fire. Although the gender and age of the deceased were initially indeterminable, the body was soon identified as Sophie Leon, recognized by the melted metal frame of her glasses embedded in her school, a signatura accessory she always wore. Determining the cause of Sophie Leon's death posed a challenge, given the extensive damage caused by the fire. Forensic experts identified multiple rib fractures, jaw cracks, and evidence of blunt force trauma on her skull and limbs, indicating prolonged and brutal beatings endured while she was still alive. Additionally, several missing teeth and severe nasal damage were evident, suggesting further infliction of injuries. However, due to the extent of the fire damage, assessing internal injuries and identifying any penetrating wounds proved impossible. The discovery of horrifying video recordings in the house, depicting Sophie being tortured and coerced into false confessions, unveiled the true sadistic nature of her captors. Sophie endured beatings with fists, an iron cord, a golf club, and even electric shock torture. She also faced degrading humiliations, such as being forced to submerge her head in a toilet until she began to suffocate. According to experts, Sophie likely died from asphyxiation before being burned, sparing her from the agony of being alive during the fire. During the trial and sentencing, Sabrina Quare and Wim Muni denied guilt and showed no remorse for their heinous crime. Following the murder, Muni calmly proceeded to a nearby supermarket, purchasing firelighter fluid for burning the body and dinner for his family, exhibiting behavior as if nothing unusual had occurred. The first court hearings against the sadistic couple commenced in March 2018. Sabrina attempted to portray herself as a victim, laying blame on Mark Walton for driving her to a pathological state with his relentless torment. Medical examinations confirmed Sabrina had mental disorders, but was deemed legally sane and capable of comprehending her actions. Despite being physically healthy, Wim was psychologically dependent on Sabrina, dominated and blindly obedient to her. Testimonies from former lovers describe Sabrina as a cunning manipulator, calculated in her actions rather than mentally unstable. On June 26, 2018, 
the court found the couple guilty of torturing, humiliating, and murdering their nanny under aggravating circumstances. They were sentenced to life imprisonment, with eligibility for parole only after 30 years. Despite continuous appeals to mitigate their sentences, neither admitted guilt. Sabrina attempted to feign insanity, hoping for transfer from prison to a hospital, but was unsuccessful. Mark Walton, present at the trial, expressed remorse over his ex-lover's actions, acknowledging her atrocities were committed to gain his attention and financial compensation. He extended his deepest condolences to the victim's parents and voluntarily issued a substantial check to support the grief-stricken family. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell for more shocking stories ahead.